Good morning. Welcome back to Grounds. Yeah. Five years? Has it been five years or longer? longer. Much longer? Well, we're glad you're here. I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement. And our partners <laughs> with uh, Reunion's uh, alumni seminars are the uh, Alumni Association. We partner in presenting these, these seminars to you. We've got uh, about eight seminars throughout today, so we hope you'll take advantage of all of them. All right, you'll fit, them, fit it in your busy schedule today. So we ordered up perfect weather for the weekend. So we hope you enjoy that as well. So before we begin, if you'll go ahead and silence the ringer on your phones. Also, we passed out uh, feedback cards. I think they're on green sheets of paper. If you'll take a moment at the end of the program and fill those out. We do use your comments in planning uh, future reunions talk. So thank you for taking the time to do that. I'm going to introduce our moderator for today, and then I'm going to turn it over to her, and she'll be uh, talking uh, presenting her panel, the other panelists to you, and um, we'll go from there. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. So Angela Orobar is the moderator for, the, for today. She's the program director and teaching faculty uh, for the graduate C uh, certificate program in cybersecurity with the University of Virginia School of Continuing Professional Studies. Angela brings a broad spectrum, spectrum of expertise in cybersecurity as technologist, researcher, educator, and author. I'm going to turn things over to Angela. Thank you so much for being here, and please help me welcome our panel for today. So thank you, Althea. And we did hack the weather grid so that you got great weather uh, this weekend. Um, but thank you, Althea, for the introduction. As she said, um, I'm an assistant professor here with the School of Continuing and Professional Studies, where I lead cybersecurity and IT programs for our students. Um, I've been here, though, for about a year and a half. So I actually spent the last 20 years of my career prior to that working out in industry, in the commercial world, uh, mostly securing the Department of Defense systems. And for the last 15 years, right before I got here, I was with one of the big consulting companies up in the Northern Virginia area called Booz Allen Hamilton. If you've heard of them, most people have. They've been hitting the press every now and then. Um, and I was chief scientist and fellow there. Um, so I've had a, a lot of experiences in my career which I've been able to bring to UVA. So I welcome you and I thank you uh, for coming out this morning to learn about the good, the bad, and the ugly of today's connected cyber world and how you can be more secure uh, in your online activities. And I'd like to introduce my panelists here today. Um, we've got Jason Belford and we've got Ryan White and I would like to have them uh, give a little bit about a, about their background as well. Sure. So, hi folks. Uh, my name is Ryan Wright. I'm an associate professor in the McIntyre School of Commerce. Do we have any McIntyre folks here? Yeah, great. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <clears throat> I look at organizational resilience to technology attacks. So, what that basically means is how organizations can use technology to really um, mitigate some of these cybersecurity threats that, that are happening. So you're going to see a little bit of my research. My background is I got a PhD in business and cognitive psychology. So a lot of the things that we do has to do with protecting the human. So I'm going to talk a lot about kind of tips that, and tricks that we can use to, to act better online. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Belford. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer here at the university. Um, I joined the university about a year and a half ago. Um, we are on implementing a very large security program here now. Prior to coming to the university, I worked cybersecurity at Georgia Tech. I was at Georgia Tech for about 20 years. So I bring a lot of, uh, of the front lines back to the university here to help protect our students, our data, uh, your data. Um, so thank you, welcome. All right, thank you very much, Jason and Ryan. Um, so one of the statistics that I've seen most recently is that 64% of Americans have experience some sort of a cyber attack. And that 64% number is trending up. So we're right now almost two out of three Americans and we're, we're going up. So let's start uh, the panel discussion here with our first question. We really wanna talk about what is the 64% made of and why does cybersecurity matter? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So let's talk about the biggest a uh, new story in cybersecurity probably this year, and this is the WannaCry ransomware. So who has heard of this attack before in the popular press? It is out there. So this is actually a screenshot 
of what it looks like if uh, it infected your machine. Um, and what it basically is, it's typically what it's delivered via email. You click on a link, you click on an attachment, something of those effects. It installs a little program that starts encrypting your files. And what that means is that you're not able to use your files anymore. Um, it's a business. So you'll see right here what they want you to do is they want you to buy access to your files back. And in fact, some variants of the WannaCry virus, will, it's a freemium model, will give you a couple of files back for free if you want to try it out. And then, well, if you want to pay for the full, the full encryption, then you'll, you'll pay via, via Bitcoin, so, which is an anonymous currency that we have out there. And why this is kind of interesting for us as security researchers, and I think for everybody in the popular press right now, is because how wide uh, of an attack this was. So if you look at kind of the, the, the map of where this was, um, this was everywhere, as you can imagine. And some, there are some centers, and it started out in the UK. Uh, the first news stories came out about it encrypting systems um, in the national health care um, of the UK. But it really went everywhere uh, for this. And people on different systems were affected by this, and different countries were affected by this, et cetera. So I want to talk briefly about where this came from, kind of what the, what the culture is behind this, who's doing this, and why they're doing this, just so we get an understanding of what that is. Um, so we get some perspective about what's going on and why are these people attacking our particular systems. What's interesting about this particular attack is it focused on older systems. So if you have a brand new computer with Windows 10 and you've updated it, um, you probably weren't affected by this particular attack. But hospitals, and especially medium and small business, are notorious for not uh, having updated systems. And in fact, if you go to your doctor's office, you might see a Windows XP, which is 13 years old now, uh, running your medical records. So this is uh, targeted towards those types of business. And in fact, when you go and check in at airlines, uh, one of my favorite screenshots was a Lufthansa key, uh, check-in kiosk with the ransomware on it. Um, so these are, these are the types of things and systems they are trying to attack. And where did this come from? This comes from something that we call uh, the dark web. So let me explain what this is. The public web is anything you can kind of access from Google. So you go and you can Google it and you find your web and you, you do what you need to do. So you go to Facebook or you go wherever you need to, to go. Most of the internet, most of the World Wide Web is actually not indexed, cannot be found by Google. So this is what we call the deep web. The deep web is you need special ways to get into these particular websites. You have to know their names or you have to use specialized software, et cetera, to get into that. And there's a subset of the deep web called the dark web where these criminals kind of hang out. And what they do <clears throat> is they actually trade software. So the WannaCry is a piece of software that anybody in this room could go and buy and release on anyone else. And that is mostly what happens with these cyber criminals. In fact, 99% of cyber attacks are from some application, somebody, some service, some business. So you can rent it. You can go and you can pay $1,500 to gain access to this piece of software and launch an attack on any organization that you want. So it's an industry. It's a software industry. These are entrepreneurs. And in fact, I've said a lot of times, I wish these entrepreneurs were, were working to, towards doing some good because they come up with some really good ideas. Um, you know, when we look at, you know, what this is worth, so we, we think of this as the public web and then the deep web, which is much bigger, as you can see, and I, I use the iceberg metaphor, is what is the, these people, uh, what do these people actually look for, and what, it, what does this marketplace look, look like? So um, I've been doing this since uh, the mid-90s, and back then when, when things were more, more or less a wild, wild west, I used to... Uh, want to go investigate what's out there, what these cyber criminals are doing. So uh, most of the time, uh, I did that using my wife's laptop because I didn't want anything to happen to my laptop. Um, so some of these screenshots actually come directly from my wife's laptop, which she gets a new laptop every six months, and I don't think she's figured out why quite yet. Um, so this is, this is something that you're going to see similar. This is, a, this is a, a fellow who is selling a full profile. So this means... Fulls is something that, that is a term that they use. We got full information on this person. Do you want to buy them? Here's an 816 credit score. 
here's their age, here's their mail, here's where they are, do you want to buy this person's identity? So you can go on the dark web and you can buy their particular identity. So this is the information they're stealing. So they might steal a little bit from one website. They might go somewhere else and steal a little bit of information. But like good marketing companies, they're building a full profile of you so they can turn around and sell it. The better the profile, the more it's worth, right? So it is you know, marketing, the dark side of marketing. So I want to show you a couple things of say, what, what's a credit card worth online if you were uh, a criminal wanting to buy one? So the current rate, and I looked this up uh, 2 o'clock yesterday, I think I sent this. The current rate for a US credit card is between 5 and $8 for your credit card number with the access code on them. Now, if you get all the details of the credit card, you know, zip code, mailing address, et cetera, it'll go up to $30. There's also all sorts of different types of accounts. One of the most popular accounts that are the most expensive right now that you can buy online are people's Netflix account or their HBO Go accounts. So there could be people out there using their Netflix or HBO Go accounts in your account. They log on and they use that particular service and they can buy these things. So this is a criminal enterprise. A lot of people estimate it's in the trillions on what this dark marketplace exists, but this is kind of why they do it because there's a lot of money to be made. And one of my favorite stories is uh, there was a, a early 20s guy that was caught in San Diego a few years back by the FBI. And he would steal people's information and sell it and steal it and sell it. And he came, became very, very good at this. And so I asked the, the fellow in charge, how did, how did you end up catching him? And he goes, well, he went to try and buy a Porsche using cash. That usually raises a little bit of a red flag. So, you know, these people are not, you know, people out in China. These people are not necessarily these people out in Russia. Those exist, but their entrepreneurs can be anywhere, including, you know, San Diego, a 22-year-old that made millions of dollars stealing and selling your information. I'm going to turn it over to Jason um, because he has some ideas about uh, email information, which is really interesting. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so your email, everybody in here has got email. We're all using email. And most people don't think about how valuable it is. Um, your email is a center stone of all of this. So think about this. Your credit card company has your email address. You forget your password to your credit card company, and so you go on their website and you click, I forgot my password. So what's the first thing they do? They email you a link to go click on to make sure it's you. If, let's assume for a second, a bad guy has access to your email, guess what he also has access to? Your, your credit card account, your bank account, everything that's tied to that email. Up on the screen right here, this was a, this was a diagram put together by a gentleman named Brian Krebs. He's a, he's a researcher and reporter. And he talked about all the things that are connected to an email account. Bad guys love email accounts. And it's one of the easiest things for them to get because all of this stuff is tied to it. Um, if it was someone who was, you see the top is your calendar, your contacts. They know where you are. They know who you're with. They know all, all your folks. All of those social media things you're doing, Facebook, and every one of those is worth money. Every account they can get is worth more of that money that, that Ryan talked about just a minute ago. Um, a few years ago, there was a company called, there still, still exists, there's a company called Zappos. Anybody shop on Zappos? Okay, I see a couple hands. Um, so Zappos, for your login, uses your email address. It also uses, it uses a password. Zappos was broken into a couple years ago and they got all the usernames and passwords. Well, if they have your email address and they have a password, what's one of the first things they're going to go tr try is to try to log in your email with that password. Uh, my mom was a victim of that. Um, they went over to her email. They logged in with her email, because and they, she used the same password on both of those sites. And then my mom also had in her email a little folder called all my passwords. She would email all her passwords to herself so she could keep them in this nice folder. And so now the bad guys had all of that information. So, the reason I put this in here is think about that as far as your email. It is, it is a gold mine. We, we talk about protecting credit cards, bank accounts, all of those other things, but don't forget this one. 
All right, so this slide here, I know it's a little bit of an eye chart, but it's kind of like that on purpose. Um, if you have accounts on any of these websites, then your username and your password may have been compromised, so similar to what Jason was just talking about. This list is from one of those dark websites that Ryan talked about. And on this website, they have over 7 million credentials for sale. Uh, and a, an attacker can go to this website, choose from a drop-down menu of over 500 different websites with uh, various credentials. Now, for this slide, I narrowed it down to just 200. So there's only 200 on this slide, but there's actually 500 on the actual website. And there's a few that I just highlighted because they're a little more common, a little more popular. Probably a lot of you may have an account on walmart.com if you've ever ordered anything online there. I was thinking, I actually, yep, Netflix is one of them that I also highlighted as well because uh, it's pretty popular. And as Ryan said, a lot of those credentials are out floating around. Costco, Apple, Bank of America, so your banks are even on there. So this is just another example of like what Ryan was talking about with that iceberg and all of the type of information that can be included on that dark web. And like I said, this, this is one site on the dark web with over 7 million credentials for sale. So like when Ryan was talking about, they may only sell from 3 to $5, 30 at the most. These folks are making tons of money on volume. So this brings us into our next question for the panel. The bad guys are getting our information. Um, they're selling it. They're using it for a variety of purposes. How is this happening? What specific types of attacks should we be concerned about? So I, I want to uh, preface talking about phishing, which you probably have heard about. But we're, we're going to knock you down and then build you up. So we're going to try and scare you a little bit, and then we'll tell you how actually to mitigate. So it's not going to be all doom and gloom, believe it or not. Um, but I think it's important to really understand, and using the lens of some of the research that, that we've done here, is to really understand what's going on. It seems to build resilience. Uh, one of the things is, you know, the common phishing attacks. Phishing has changed substantially since I started investigating this with the Microsoft Anti-Phishing Toolbar team uh, 13 years ago now. Um, it used to be there, you know, the, the awful phishing scams that were out there. Um, and here's some ones that I've captured on my wife's computer along the years. Um, so you used to get the really bad ones. So this is one from 2006 when I started as a researcher. Dear generic bank user, that's, uh, it's a really well-formed phishing email. This was sent to millions of people. Uh, it, you've probably also got the ones where, where there's you know, a Nigerian prince that just needs that extra $1,500 to make uh, everything right in, in his world, and then he'll reimburse you, et cetera. So it really started out as these kind of, kind of clickbait um, selling products sometimes. Um, and then they started being a little bit more sophisticated. So here's an attack a couple of years later for the um, IRS. IRS continues to be the uh, most used brand probably in the United States, especially around tax time. We all know um, as security researchers and even talking to some of the agents at the IRS, they'll never send you an email. Um, but they're even getting more sophisticated in, you, in calling you uh, using voice phishing type of activities to try and get your information, et cetera. And that actually has happened um, to friends of mine as well. That, so I have personal knowledge where somebody was on the phone. I was like, keep them on the phone. I'm coming right over um, kind of thing. Uh, so it, it moved from the Internal Revenue Service, and now they're getting uh, a little more personalized. So here's one I recently got. This is an invitation to a wedding. I love weddings. This sounds great. Why wouldn't I click on this particular invitation to the wedding? Um, another, another thing is somebody said something about you on Facebook. Do you want to see what they said? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to see what they said. Um, so they're getting more and more sophisticated. So you know, 13 years ago, they would send out millions of messages. Right now, the average phishing campaign is 13 messages. So what that means is they're targeting towards specific people using information that they garnered from the website, from your LinkedIn profile, from your Facebook profile, from some of those other websites that are out there about you and targeting based on who you know and what you're doing. So they're very, very good. Um, sadly enough, here's a story that a, a company I worked with uh, in Southern California, an import-export business, and this is the actual email that they got, a UPS email saying, you have a UPS bill. So what happened is their accounts receivable person clicked on that particular email and installed something called a key logger. And what a key logger does is it, it, um, it captures every single keystroke that you do. 
So if you type in AmericanExpress.com and then your username and password, which is pretty common when you go to those websites, it captures that and sends it back to the criminals. Well, what happened is they logged into their bank account to do wire transfers as they normally do for import-export businesses. The criminals captured that information and stole $250,000 from their... This is a small business that had to declare bankruptcy because of a cybersecurity attack. So this is, you know, the big folks that you hear in the news can survive these attacks. It's the smaller folks that, that really concerns me, the smaller businesses and even the individuals that it will impact that don't have the resources to do that. So these are the types of messages that you're going to get. And we're going to show you techniques on, on maybe how to do a better job at detecting these in, in a moment, but they're out there and they're targeted towards you and they may even be from some of your friends. Um, moving forward. So that's that's the, a common attack that we see is those phishing attacks, and I'm sure you've seen them in your inbox as well. And there's others as well. Oh, right. Sorry. So I want to talk about my research a little bit. So I've been doing phishing research, and I've been looking at it. Um, the good news is, is I've been able, in different organizations and through different people, so I've fished, I think I counted uh, well over... 10,000 people in the last 10 years to see what they did, these mock phishing attacks. So I'm not, I'm, not, um, I'm not grabbing your username and password, but I'm seeing if you give it up, and then I'm destroying that information along the way. Um, and, and what we found through doing this over and over in different organizations is that there's a misconception about who falls for these attacks. It says, oh, are there gender differences? We've never found any gender difference. Well, maybe it's social economic status. We've never found social economic status as an indicator of you being more or less susceptible. How about people that trust people a lot? You know that person that just kind of has that, that I'll trust them until I don't kind of attitude. That, you know, using these psychological behaviors, we haven't found that to be an indicator as well. And how about people that take risks either online or in, in are, are they more susceptible? And again, and again, doing these psychological profiles and then actually doing phishing testing, we haven't found that these factors are the case. So what are the factors um, for this? So we have, in our research, in a, in a number of different papers, we say there's really three types of people who do a really good job at detecting these. The good, the good news is is that one of these skills is learned. So it's just not an innate skill. The first thing, if you've experienced phishing before and you've seen what it actually does to you or somebody close by you, you, you are much more aware. And this really thinks, if you have a context and you understand what's going on, you have a much higher likelihood of saying, I'm not gonna fall for that attack. So it's really, fool me once, you got me, fool me twice, it doesn't happen again, is, is really true for a lot of cases in phishing. And, and Jason will tell you, not everybody is like that, uh, but for the most part, uh, that's absolutely the case. So really understanding what phishing is, if we gave a people a, a quiz saying, can you, do you know what phishing is? Can you describe what phishing is and what it does and why it, why it happens? And the people who performed highly on that quiz, just b basic an understanding of, yeah, they're trying to get me to click on this link, so something installs on my computer, are 80% less likely to click on other links if they just understand what those attacks are. So if you want to build resilience in yourself or anybody else, just that basic concept. Another thing I'm gonna talk about is this concept of mindfulness. So I d I've done in the last five years a lot of research on how do you use technology mindful, right? So this comes from everything to when the first thing you do at night in the, or the first, first thing you do in the morning and the last thing you do at night is look at your phone. That's non-mindful use of technology, right? That's mindlessness use of technology. Or if you ever got those phantom rings in your pocket where you think your phone is buzzing but it's actually not, your, your body is responding to that mind, mindlessness use of technology. So we've developed kind of a, a mindful way of using, of thinking about your e email. So you don't have to worry about all the content, all the cues, but really being focused on that. And I'll give you a few tips at the end of this about what mindfulness technology is. All right, and this is an ex another example of ransomware. Ryan talked about that at the very beginning when he was talking about WannaCry hitting the 300,000 plus computers. And this is just a different example of ransomware, so I'm not gonna go into the details that he already covered, but this one is Tesla Crypt. 
and users usually get infected because they've been fished, like Ryan was just talking about, and they click on a link um, that will install this software and encrypt their files. Um, sometimes it's an email, like he showed some examples of things that come through email, but my father-in-law fell for this because it's coming through Facebook right now as well. Um, there's some things transferring through uh, the Messenger app in Facebook. It looks like you get a message from one of your friends, but you click on it and it's actually ransomware. And so my father-in-law's computer got locked down and he didn't want to pay the ransom. And all of the family photos that he's taken for uh, himself and my mother-in-law, they're gone now. Um, so I do think the ransomware, it's just one of the, I think, meanest types of uh, attacks out there in general. And it's not just hitting uh, individuals. Um, like Ryan said earlier, uh, hospitals, you know, get hit with ransomware qu quite frequently because they'll pay the high dollar. You know, hospitals are paying in the tens of thousands of dollars to get the private key so that they can unlock all of their files and get back to their data. Um, so this is just something to be aware of when you're getting phishing emails like Ryan was just talking about. So I, I'm going to interrupt you really quickly here, and I'm going to put Jason on the spot. Um, um, as the uh, Chief Information Security Officer for UVA, um, you've had, say, an attack, it's locked down, a ransomware attack, it's locked down some computers. Do you pay? So the good news is I don't have to make that decision. <laughs> it really is a business decision. I mean, if, if I was in charge of the business, it depends. Um, you hear about some of these hospitals that have been in the news that they're, they were completely out of business. These hospitals that are helping people survive, they could have gone to their backup tapes and they could have spent the next 42 days restoring from backup tape or they could pay $10,000. If a life's on the line, that $10,000 doesn't sound so bad, but then you're also, you're, you're just fueling that criminal enterprise. So it's a hard decision, it's a business decision. Um, I'm glad I, I can give the, I can tell our business decisions, here's the risk of doing it and let them make that decision. So I'm going to put Angela on the spot, too, and, and, and I, uh, I asked him not to do this to me. Um, <laughs> so would you, would you give advice to your, to your father-in-law? Would, would you say pay or not pay? I, you... told, I actually told him to pay, um, and I know there's a lot of controversy, especially amongst cybersecurity researchers and practitioners, on whether you should pay. A lot of people say, don't pay, because we don't want to keep this going. We don't want to incentivize them. Don't pay. But I also knew how attached my father-in-law was to his photos. And uh, the rest of the family kind of wanted access to some of those photos. So I did. I said, you know, you can pay. I said, you do take a risk. You know, the attackers might not make good on their promise of giving you the key. And you might not be able to get your data even after you pay. But honestly, a lot of what I'm seeing is they do make good on their promise. And you do get the key. Um, and they even give you tech support. And they have a lot of help. <laughs> Yep, there's tech support built into this. They'll tell you exactly what you need to do to get Bitcoin in order to pay them, and they actually make the process pretty easy. So I did recommend that he pay, and actually a statistic I saw recently is two out of three companies do pay. Because like Jason was saying, it's easier. It's easier than restoring a backup and all the person hours you have um, to do that restore. Now, my, my father-in-law didn't take my advice. He didn't want to take that risk to lose some money. And he just said, all right, fine, I'm starting over again. We've heard some, some uh, in these, there's some people who have called these help desk centers and said, you know what, I can't afford that money. I'm just yeah. limited. And a company will say, OK, we'll, we'll chop it in half. Yeah, don't negotiate. Uh, it's an expensive lesson to learn that you should be backing up all of those files. <laughs> if you ever had this happen. It's, it's, it's interesting, right? So it's a personal decision on whether or not to pay. Just to give you an idea, so the last um, five attacks uh, are around $300 to get your files back, right? So, you know, 300 bucks. Um, and there is, if you look at the dark web and some of these forums where there, these criminals are talking to each other, there is a little policing involved um, with themselves. They want other people to, when you pay, you get your files back. Because that ruins their business model if all of a sudden these people start not giving their files back. So there are these criminals with ethics all of a sudden popping up <laughs> that they're self-policing each other that if you pay your $300, you're, you better give your files back or we're coming after you. <laughs> um, it's, it's a really, again, for, you know, being in a business school, it's a, it's a phenomenal, interesting business model that they've built out of this. I just, again, wish they were working for us instead of against us. 
so the, the question was, um, what happens to your credit card number that gives to this? And we'll give an opportunity for everybody to ask questions at the end as well. That's a great question. So they don't want your credit card number. They probably already have your credit card number, to be quite <laughs> honest. Um, they don't want your credit card number. They want something called Bitcoin, which is an untraceable currency. So they'll tell you how to purchase Bitcoin using your credit card, et cetera. But as soon as they get the Bitcoin, then they'll transfer it to their quote unquote wallet, and then it's untraceable from then. It's like the old, um, you know, the 70s and 80s, they wanted untraceable bearer bonds. This is the new cyber untraceable bearer bond currency that's out there. Very good, very good questions. Uh, so, with this ransomware that we've been talking about, actually, here? Yeah. With the ransomware that we've been talking about, it's really obvious when you've been compromised. You know, J uh, Ryan showed the example of the big red screen. I had an example of the big blue screen. You know you've been compromised at that point. So but what about all these other types of attacks that the attackers are doing out there? How do you know that your system or that your data has been compromised from these others? So there's several services out there that you can plug your email into. Some of them are free. Some of them are not free. So I'm giving you the free one heroic here where you can plug your email into and to see if it's been compromised. So this is my personal email um, that, and this is the list. So Last.fm, which I'm a customer of, Dropbox, Tumblr, and Adobe. And there's a few other on the list I was so embarrassed by that I deleted it off this list. But these are accounts where they've gotten my username and password. So these are all, you know, and this is, we're going to give you tips on how to avoid um, and mitigate such attacks, but I would assume that if you're going to give your a company your user, user, username, assume they're going to have your password as well. So that, that kind of gives you an idea. So a lot of companies have millions of accounts stolen. And in fact, it's not even an issue anymore of how much resources this company. So this year we had the largest IPO in the history of the stock exchange. Does anybody know what that was? Snap, snap, right? Snap, unlimited resources, billions of dollars in cash. Four weeks later, Snap was attacked and accounts were stolen. So it's not a matter of the, this is, oh, we need to throw money at this particular problem. They had money to throw at every problem they wanted to at that particular time. So things have really changed as far as this. So checking your email through a site like Heroic uh, is a way to do it, and you can do that right now on your smartphone. Well, do it after um, uh, on your smartphone and check it out and see what kind of accounts have been uh, compromised through this. Another thing is, how do you know you've been hacked? There's a common way of um, of of looking at basically your web page. So when you open up your first web page and something's funny going on, so this is um, an example from my wife's computer. Um, all of a sudden, if your homepage changes, if AdWare pops up, that's, that's a common way of saying, hey, listen, something's going on with my machine. Uh, another thing that happens all the time with these is, on your particular machines that you've seen is that you have these phantom new programs pop up. Here's a virus detection program saying you have a virus that you've never seen before and it's never alerted you, and you've never installed, et cetera. So using things that are unusual usually means something is going on with your machine. You're trying to get your credentials, et cetera. Uh, another common attack that, that, that we've seen out there is, is sometimes they'll install a program after you click on something in an email, and it'll wait. And it'll wait until you go to a certain website. And one that I saw recently was, was waiting for you to go to AmericanExpress.com. So it waits for you to go to AmericanExpress.com, and when you do, it opens, you go in, obviously, your browser, you click in American Express, and it'll pop up a little box over top of the login box. And you'll look, oh, American Express is, just wants to confirm my social security number, right? And you'll go, oh, I typed in American Express, I'm going to American Express, here's American Express, ask me a question, it's, you know, another way of authenticating, you know, I might be able to do that. Again, it's these unusual things that you should always pause, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the mindful way of, of attacking this problem as well. So my father-in-law fell for that one as well, the one that says, uh, you've got these vulnerabilities, let me help you fix them. So he fell for that one as well. 
Uh, so, so far we've talked about the bad and the ugly of the cyber world and everyone's probably feeling the weight on their shoulders. So let's change that mood and let's talk a little bit more about the good. How can we all protect ourselves against these types of cyber attacks? So I'm going to say strong passwords. You hear this probably every, anything you've ever heard with cybersecurity or information security, anything you've ever heard, they say use strong passwords. Uh, they tell you to use long passwords. I agree with that one. And if, if you get one tip of all, all of this, use different passwords for every site. So if they compromise, you had an FM account, they can't then take that to your email. They can't take that to your bank. Now, I actually I act, practice what I preach, and I have 300 different passwords, right? So how are you going to remember 300 different passwords? Um, so... On the, on the, the image that's up on the screen right now is one type of password manager. There's these programs, LastPass is one of them. You can actually check all of your passwords into an encrypted store. You have one password that unlocks those. So you don't have to remember 300 different passwords, you remember one. When you go to the various sites, it'll actually fill in the forms for you by clicking its little button. And then it puts the username and password in there. That just saved you a couple things. One, you didn't have to remember 300 passwords. Two. What Ryan talked about earlier, he said something about a keylogger, where it, it has every stroke. What if there's no strokes being pushed by the keyboard? You're clicking your mouse and you're entering the password. It doesn't get that. That's another protection. It's encrypted, it's, these are safe. There's a couple different ones. I, I, like I said, I put LastPass up here, this is the one I use. Um, if there is a compromise on one of these, this company's also watching the dark web for these, and they will alert you, hey, this has been, this has been in the news, this one's compromised, do you, would you like me to change the password for you? And they'll change it to something random that you, you don't even know that they store, but you don't need to know it in most cases because you just fill it. Passwords are a dying technology. Uh, I would say they're dead. Um, they, pa passwords were first used in the 1960s. I'm not sure there's too much technology we're still using that was developed in the 60s that we still use today that we really rely on. Um, so we're moving away from the password alone. Um, I'm gonna show you how to choose a strong password and then we'll talk about alternatives to passwords that you can use that'll help you protect this even more. So that whole thing, using a strong password. Um, what we tell our folks is start with a phrase that means something to you. As alumni, you should all recognize this, right? Yes. One option is to take the first letter from each of the words and then maybe do some substitution. Now that password is on the bottom left of your screen. Anybody think that's a good password? Yeah? Is it secure? Okay. All right, let's look at another method. Some people are looking at the one, I would never remember that in a million years. I know, I wouldn't. Let's look at another method. Again, take, take a phrase, a, the first line of a poem, something that means something to you, and maybe make some substitutions here. All I did was substitute the the and for an ampersand and the spaces for dashes. That's all I did in this one. What do you think about that password? Is it more secure or less secure than the one before? Less secure, okay. Um, is it easier to remember? Okay. Let's look at method three. Same first step. Find something that means something to you. Something long that means something to you. All I did on this one was, this is called padding. I removed all the spaces and added a number at the very beginning. Easy, easy to remember? Okay. Is it secure? Yeah. And one, so the one I didn't show you on here, just for, to save a little bit of time, I didn't show you CAV2468 exclamation mark. That one would actually comply with most password policies, even the one here at the university. It's a horrible password. Um, if we were trying to break this, if, when I say time to crack it, that's using every possible combination. If I start with A, 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 and then change the last one to B, and then C, and then just go through every combination of these, it would take me about one minute to crack that password. The second one, the one, the very first one I showed you, the one we said, oh, it's kind of secure. It's secure because humans can't remember it. For a computer, I can get that one in about two hours. That third one, we thought, I heard a couple people say, yeah, it is more secure, it is. It would take me about 40,000 trillion trillion centuries. I'm not gonna be around by the time I break that one. The very last one, it was also easy to remember, 2,000 trillion 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 centuries. The big difference here is length. 
I don't have to have all the special characters and, the, and make it look like it's really hard. I can have something that's easy for me to remember as long as it's really long. The length is your friend. Now, that also means you have to type a lot more. And again, that's where the password manager comes in. But if you can type, if you can get those passwords to be long, in some services, and, and I don't know off the top of my head, may limit you to 14 characters. Great, use all 14. Some may limit you to 23. Keep going. If, especially if you have a phrase that means something to you, whether it's a poem, whether it's maybe you wrote, you wrote something at some point in your life and the, the first sentence of that is great. Something. That, those, are the, those would be my best advice for picking those strong passwords. So just a quick point, too. Um, for programs like LastPass, and there's several password managers out there as well, they will pick your password for you your, for all these sites, and it is randomly generated. It is the 2,000 trillion, trillion, trillion type of passwords um, out there. So again, it's just another reason why you'd want to use these types of software. Just to be clear, it doesn't have to pick that password. Right. It can. And so I, I have it generate random passwords for all these sites that I typically do not know. Okay, so like I said, passwords are dead. 1960s technology, most companies who are requiring password are moving away from it. So what are they going to? They're going to a second step authentication. You hear, you'll hear it called multi-factor authentication, two-step authentication. We're gonna verify who you are in a different way. They're, everybody's gonna call it something different. Um, I have a couple logos up on the screen right now. These are folks that are already doing this. Some of your banks are doing this. Some of the social media sites are doing this. UVA is already doing this. The idea is you log in first with your username and password. Once it verifies who you are, it sends you either a text message or you have to use your phone to generate a, either to say, yes, this is me, or it generates a code off your phone, something else that you have, something the bad guy would not have in his possession. You put that in the website and then it lets you in. So under that circumstance, if the bad guy got the password, he can't get past the login screen because he doesn't have that second piece. So if, you, if your banks allow this, turn it on. Let them send you that text message or the, maybe it's a phone call. And a lot, of, a lot of banks have, if they don't recognize the computer, they make, they'll either do the phone call or they'll do something to your cell phone, a text message to your cell phone. Turn all of those things on. That's helping protect against that bad guy. No matter how they get the password, if they don't have that second piece, that password means absolutely nothing. So I'm gonna draw a little bit on my training as a cognitive psychologist um, to talk, a, talk about what we can do as individuals to make better decisions. And this can be online, this could be in life, et cetera. We've done several exper uh, experiments that uses mindfulness training. And let me give you the 30-second version. There's lots of different flavors of mindfulness. You may have heard of it in the popular press. It was on the front page of, the, of uh, Time magazine uh, two years back, three years back now, et cetera. And the whole idea with mindfulness training is that you pause and reflect. That's the whole idea. You pause and reflect. And what research driven by Alan Langer, who's a Harvard business person, um, said is if you pause and reflect, you're going to make better decisions. And you're going to make better decisions in the business context as well using mindfulness. So we thought, you know, maybe uh, Langer's on to something here. Maybe there's a better way to act with technology. So we started experiments and we gave people this, this training. And the training is a yeah, three-minute video that says, listen, when you, get a, when you get an email, we don't want you to evaluate every single email. You know, I check, I, so I got 120 emails yesterday. There's no way that I could look and say, is this a phishing email? And then go to the next one. Is this a phishing email? A lot of the criminals are, are um, looking for the automatic response. So our research says, if you pause, even for less than half a second, you make better decisions. So training yourself before you click on any link in an email, before you do anything online, take less than a second to reflect saying, is this right? Our research shows that you're 120% less likely to make a bad decision with even the slightest pause. You, what else it shows is you're also a better colleague um, in an organization. You're better to work with if you pause and reflect uh, using this cadence. And it's, it's a practice thing. And it becomes automated in what you do. So as you go through your emails, if you go through your regular life, if you just take a moment, reflect, and say, is this what I should be doing? You're going to make the right decision most times. 
So this mindfulness in practice using emails or in, in technology or even before you pick up your phone um, to see what's going on, 80% of the people in the, this isn't, I'm going to pick on the millennials because it's just so easy. 80% um, of millennials pick up their phone and they're not sure what they're going to do on their phone yet, right? They go there, it's like, I'm going to do something on my phone and I'm not going there for a purpose yet. That's mindless activity, right? So just being mindful, saying, why am I doing this, really lets you make better decisions online. So when you're processing your emails and somebody sends you something, if you reflect just for a second, saying, would this person really send me this? And if, the, if it raises any sorts of red flags, then you can get into, I'm going to solve this problem mode. If it doesn't raise it, oh, of course, I'm expecting this picture from you know, my son, or I'm expecting this, this particular thing. And some of those are, you know, those are, can be very good phishing attacks, et cetera. But I want to inoculate you really from the low-hanging fruit, from that. Why, why, if you ever think, why am I getting this? Don't react to it. The easiest thing that, and I practice this, and, it, and whenever I get a, a link in an email, I actually just go to the website, type in, if somebody sends me a Facebook thing or if somebody sends me a LinkedIn um, request or whatever those are, just go to LinkedIn because they're going to be there too rather than doing the lazy automatic response, which is clicking on that particular link. So using mindfulness practices, um, believe it or not, really has some benefits on, on you as a person, but with technology and being more secure as well. Um, and I'm excited about this line of research because we've gone into different organizations and saw not only an improve their security, um, but it improved their productivity as well. They do a better job at what they're, what they're tasked to do. So I would, I would encourage everybody, to, if they're interested in this, it's, it, it's all over the popular press. I'm happy to share um, mindfulness training, but it is a, a kind of interesting new way of making decisions. I liked uh, Ryan's example about the millennials picking up their phone but not knowing what they're going to do with it. Normally what happens with me is I pick my phone up to do something, and by the time I put in my passcode, I forgot what I picked it up to do. So that's definitely a difference between me and the millennials. But uh, I actually used Ryan's uh, mindfulness um, training yesterday. Um, in between meetings, I try to check my email. A lot of things come in because I'm out and about doing a lot of things all the time, so I'm usually just quickly going through emails. And I got one yesterday, and it looked like it came from our IT department. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, it looked like it came from our IT department. Just quick scanning, it looked pretty official. But I thought, you know, hmm, let me sit here and think about this. But then I thought to myself, well, geez, I don't have time to think about this. I have a lot of other e emails. So I left it, and I kept going. However, that one little thought of let me sit here and think about this was all I needed. Because as I started going through the rest of my emails, there was another email from our actual IT person who said, do not click on anything in that. That was a phishing email. So I'm, I'm not sure at this point how many other people may have not stopped and paused or just continued on looking at the rest of their email, and they may have fallen for it. So I really do believe in this mindfulness training in all aspects of your life, and I love how Ryan is applying that to cybersecurity. Um, just a quick follow-up, and I forgot to talk about the mnemonic. You stop, think, act is kind of what is a common thing. You're probably seeing that a lot. In uh, People are using it. The IRS is now using this kind of similar phraseology. And the idea is stop with mindfulness, stop, reflect. And that doesn't mean take 10 minutes to figure out what's going on. It really is less than a second going, ah, something's funny here, I'm going to move on. Um, and if you need to process it, that's when you can do your thinking. So you can choose what to actually make the decision about. And then if still you're not sure about that, you always ask somebody else. It, it seems just about 99% of the time, if you ask somebody else, if you, if you ask somebody else the question, is like, does this seem legit to you? You've already answered that question by, yeah, no, it probably, it, it probably isn't legit. So that stop, think, act is that first step towards mindfulness. There are a few other things that we may, wanted to make sure that we talked with you about today, um, and this is to protect your credit card or your credit information. So one of the things that I wanted to mention that's pretty um, important to do sometimes is to put a fraud alert on your credit, uh, your credit file. And what this fraud alert is going to do is it's going to have creditors contact you before they open any new accounts for you or before they make any changes to any of your existing accounts. So the fraud alert is 
really easy to add to your credit. You only need to call one of the top three credit companies, and once you call one, they'll let the others know for you. Now, the trick is with this, though, is you have to renew it every 90 days. So you want to put that in your calendar. You want to keep that fraud alert out there. But this can be really helpful. And there's another thing that you can do, which this slide is showing, is actually putting a credit freeze on your credit file. And what this does is this makes it so that potential creditors, they can't even pull your credit report. And I have a friend who's in the mortgage business, and I asked her, I said, do you come across, because she pulls credit reports to try to get home loans for people, and I said, do you come across this pretty frequently? And she said, yeah, nowadays I'm really coming across this pretty frequently. So all the user has to do then is just give permission for her to be able to go and pull that credit. And what this does is that freeze will make it less likely that an identity thief can open new accounts in your name as well. So it's very helpful. On top of these two things that you can do for free, um, you can also purchase an identity theft um, protection and credit monitoring services. Um, and there's a lot of different thoughts about which ones are good, which ones aren't good, whether it's really worth it and not worth it. And I don't know if either of my other two panelists want to weigh in on their thoughts on that. But that is an option that a lot of people choose as well. I'll weigh in on this one. Um, the, I would definitely, uh, Angela's talked about credit freezing. Freezing is, is exactly what it sounds like. You freeze it. Until you go back online and say, I want to open this up, no one can get credit in your name. I make an analogy to this of your house. You can have an alarm system, and those are great. That, and that's what that credit monitor, a lot of those credit monitoring services you're going to buy are those alarm systems you're going to put on your house. But what's the first thing you do? You lock your front door. So the guy comes in and, and wiggles that doorknob. It's locked. He goes to the next house. That's that freeze. So the alarm is not as necessary when you have everything nice and secure. That's the freeze. The credit monitoring, all of those things, are that alarm system. What's, what's nice about credit monitoring is I would probably guess 50% of the people in this room already have it because they've been a victim of the Aetna attack, the you know insert attack there, and then all of a sudden you get this email saying, hey, we're monitoring your credit. And in fact, uh, I was talking to uh, another chief information security officer at a company and what they do is, is they make risk decisions. It's how valuable is this data worth? And they go, you know what? If this data is broken into, it's going to cost us $30 per person to monitor their credit. So that's what the companies are valuing your information as. It's a risk model. It's, it's just going to cut for this million, it's just $30 million. Should we spend more than $30 million securing this? No. Let's just give them free credit monitoring Instead, does anybody have free credit monitoring out of a, a, an attack? Yeah, it's pretty common um, and pretty easy to get, and it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, it's it's for me in my house and the way we operate. It's a no brainer, really. Oh, I, I'll I'll share you as much all or none, whatever you're most comfortable with with this. We, we can make that happen for sure. Um, so we, this is perfect. We're moving kind of to the question stage, so I'll let uh, Angela introduce that, and then we'll, we'll give you some prescriptions for sure. Yeah, the last uh, but not least slide here is um, backing up your data, which we've already talked about before, but we want to reinforce that before we move in, into the questions. And I mean, you could back it up by praying that nothing happens, but I actually recommend some other products that would be very helpful. I personally use a service called Carbonite. It's an online system. It automatically backs up my my data, um, when I have new files, it goes ahead and it backs it up. I pay, I think it's about $60 a year for Carbonite, and it really has saved me a few times. My laptop crashed just because it was you know, old and things break, and it crashed, and I was able to restore all of my data. So I use Carbonite as an online service. It's automatically in the background, backing things up for me. I also have an external hard drive that I purchased, so that's a one-time payout that I purchased, that I plug into my computer, and I do this every few days, and that will, I, since I run a Mac, I have something on there that's built in called Time Machine, and it'll automatically make a copy of all of my data onto that hard drive there as well. So I have two different methods of backing up my data. So Carbonite's the one I use. I, I've heard great things about Crash Plan. That's another one as well that's good for backup. But you know, backup, that's what would have really helped my father-in-law with the ransomware. And I think it would have helped him also when the other thing that he fell for kind of crashed his computer as well. So I wanted to, to make sure that we reinforce backup. And now we can move on into the questions. 
So we are podcasting, so can you wait? We are podcasting, so if you can... I can't do that from here. Okay, we are podcasting. <laughs> so if you can wait for the mic before you ask your question. Thanks. Um, the question has to do with what do you do when you get one of the emails that you're suspicious of? Do you trash it? Do you send it to spam? What else should you do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what I suggest, uh, there's really two courses of action from this. A lot of these spam emails that you're going to get, um, depending on your service, you can just hit a button somewhere and say, I think this is spam, and that helps other, protect other people. Um, that's the most common thing to do. If you're in an organization, you would probably want to read you would want to let Jason know at abuse.virginia.edu. Um, but if it's your personal email, it, if there's a spam button, hit that and delete it, and then move on with your life. What we do not want to do, and one of the things that I've been really pushing and, and really looking at lately is we don't want to make security this huge thing that's this overhead, because then people just won't do it. We don't want to make your password this incredibly difficult thing to remember that we, we, we reset every 30 days, because people just won't do that. So what we want to do is make you aware. This is what's going on. You should probably be this, you know, maybe act mindful about these particular things. So when you come across something like that, yeah, let people know if that's an easy thing for you to do. If not, um, you know, delete it and move on. Jason may have a different answer because he likes data. Well, I do like data, but I was going to say, and actually I agree. We, we agree on this answer. The one thing I'll, I'll say, please, 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 please do not do, do not respond to it. Don't even resp hit reply and say, I know you're a bad guy. Because what you've done is you've confirmed that someone's reading that email address, you're going to become a bigger target. Don't click on the link to see where it goes. Well, let me see, because it may be too late. Just delete it. I have a couple of things I can add to that as well. If it looks like it's coming from a friend, call that friend. You know how I said some ransomware was coming through Facebook Messenger? So it looks like it's coming from your friend on Facebook. Call that friend before you click on it. Did you send me this message? And they probably are going to say, I don't even know what you're talking about. And the same thing um, you know, for the IT phishing email that I said I just got yesterday. We called our IT folks and we said, this is, did you guys send this out? And they said, absolutely not. We did not send that out. So you can do the same thing with your bank. If you get something from your bank or your credit card in your email and you're just not quite sure, you can call them directly. Now, don't call any numbers that's in the email. Pick up your card and call the number that's on the back of your card, and then they can, they can walk through that email with you, and they can help you identify whether that was legitimate or not. So those are a few other pointers as well. Just, just As they're getting to the question back there, I just want to point out, you've already won, right? You've already done the stop and I'm going to, you know, you've already done the stop. You've already done the, if you do the act, that's gravy. You've already won. So if you've gotten that far and you just stop, say something's going on here, and you do nothing else, you're already fine. So, so the question was antivirus programs, the, the, the McAfee, the Nortons, the um, Kaperskys, all those things. I would say they're, um, I, I run them on my personal machine. Um, there's different ones for, you know, Macs, or there's, there's, there's the, the versions for Macs and versions for Windows. I'd say the way the world works now, it's just so much easier to do that than not to do that. Um, so, I, and I know what Jason's answer is going to be. He's going to say, absolutely, 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 because he makes us put, put them on on all of our machines at the university. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So they're about 50% effective at catching malware. So viruses, that, they're not going to catch phishing most of the time. They're not going to catch some of the other threats. For viruses, they're about 50% effective. Well, that's 50% you don't have to worry about, right? So yeah, put them on there. They're, they're inexpensive or free. So just put them on there. It gets the 50% of the viruses, but there's still the phishing to worry about and some of these other things. Uh, I have a question. When uh, you enter a password in a site and the box pops up and says, do you want us to remember this password for you? Is there any security risk in letting the computer save the password or not? So typically that's coming directly from your local computer. Um, there's, there is going to be security risk in doing that. So here's the risk. 
the risk is you get a virus on your computer that can then read that store and they'll have your passwords. Um, I would rather you use something like a password manager like we talked about with the LastPass. It will do that same thing. It will save the passwords and it will let you fill them in. Um, and those are typically encrypted stores versus having the, the browser store that could get infected and, and, and get pulled. So it is a risk. Um, it's better than some of the alternatives um, of especially having the same password on every site. But if you can avoid using that, that would be my suggestion. So uh, I view security kind of like, um, how do you not get eaten by a bear in the woods? And, and, and the thing about that is it, the, the, the criminals are, are tend to be a little bit lazy too. So you don't necessarily have to outrun everyone. You just have to outrun the slowest people. So in this case, um, for me, I say, yeah, if, if it's a choice between not doing that and doing that, it's a no-brainer. It is much more secure than doing nothing at all or writing down your passwords or storing them in email, which, believe it or not, happens all the time. Um, that's way more secure. But the most secure method is doing LastPass or a password manager to have you do that. So on a gradient, is like, you know, that's terrible to, yeah, that's good, but if you want to be really good, then you do a password manager. This um, thievery technology is creating a problem and an expense for all of us and is, a, is an economic threat. What is the federal government doing about it? These people have created the Wild West. Let's just go out and shoot a few of them. The word will get out. So uh, they might, if you can tell them who they are. Um, one of the biggest problems right now is, is that problems identifying who these criminals are and how they reconstellate into different groups. This is the mob 50 years ago. This is the mob. It's organized crime, uh, reconstellated in a different way. And it's taxing our society tremendously. So we spend in this country uh, $200 billion in technology, organizations spend in technology preventing these types of attacks. So Jason has a large budget. Uh, he'd like a larger budget, as if every CISO. So where does that, that, that goes directly to the consumer, right? That goes directly to the taxpayer. That goes directly to, to different things. The federal government, believe it or not, and I've worked with them on a few different projects, and Angela has worked on them much more than I have, is very concerned about this, uh, very concerned about this. Um, and in fact, most of my, um, most of the research I do is through federal government, um, usually grants to the National Science Foundation or the National Health Institute, because they're so concerned about this that they realize that we need to pour dollars and resources to understand this particular problem. Now, when is enough is enough, I, it goes back to the risk model, right? So you're going, I have a million, I have a million identities I need to secure. It's costing me $40 million to the secure them. Well, maybe it should, I'll back that off a bit. It cost me $30 million because it's only going to cost me $30 million if these identities are exposed anyways. Maybe we need to change on how, um, on that particular risk model to incentivize companies to say, listen, this is more than you just providing credit. One of the, um, if, if you look at the, uh, one of the more progressive uh, places who've done this is in southern New York, which is, uh, you know, um, SEC country kind of thing. Um, the, their uh, attorney general has changed the laws for publicly traded companies that are hacked into. Now they have to disclose it. There wasn't six months ago a way for people to let know that a, a public company had been attacked. Now, if you are a publicly traded company in southern New York, you have to disclose it and go through a process of reporting it to the federal government, telling how you're mitigating that problem. So right now, believe it or not, we've been dealing with this problem for 15 years, but really our legal and policy is still in catch-up catch -up mode. I have two questions, if I may. Uh, one is, what do McAfee and Norton do that Windows 10 itself doesn't do? And two, I use a password manager that basically just saves a password, it's fingerprinted, protected, but then requires you to click the password onto the site. So what you're telling me is that's really not that safe. Is that right? So and I'm not, sure, not familiar with the one you're using, but if it, if it, um, one safe? Okay, I'm not familiar with that one. If it's, if it's secured behind your, pass, uh, your, your fingerprint, then it, it's, I'm going to say that's definitely raising the bar. I'm not familiar with that one enough to say how secure it is. 
Uh, but that sounds like it's actually better than a lot of the others. Because it, it is, the, the, the normal bad guy's not gonna come and have your fingerprints, right, to be able to unlock it. But are you clicking inside or are you actually typing in the, are you typing in the password? Um, it, it, it could go back to what Ryan was saying. It, it's better than nothing at all, and it's probably not as good as the ones we're suggesting, but it, you're probably on the higher side there. Um, the other question you had was, uh, what does Norton and any of these do that Windows doesn't? Um, Windows, the new Windows 10 does come with its own antivirus. Um, they're they're complementary to each other. Some of them will, some will catch some, some will catch another. Um, I, I don't know if the if the Delta is so much that it's worth paying for. I don't know. Um, I have Macs at home, and, and Macs come with. There's a, a couple free programs that I use for the Macs. Um, Windows. just be echoing what he just said on that um, and I think that using what Windows has built in plus something like McAfee you know I try to think of that as kind of my my front door I've got the lock on the actual door handle but I've also got a dud bolt as well and they both kind of serve different purposes there but they're both protecting me um, could you tell me your opinions on uh, start advising friends not to use Kaspersky, Kaspersky uh, virus anymore because the Russians own them and uh, is that too paranoid? And for example, like when Opera Browser got bought by the Chine a Chinese firm, and just the, the, the lack of trust of foreign actors. So Ryan's got a very strong opinion on this, and I'll, and I'll, I'll let him give his opinion on this. Um, I was in a meeting one time, and a Kaspersky rep was there, and she asked, why are, aren't people in this room using Kaspersky? And I said, because you're a Russian-owned company. She said, we are not. Our holdings are out of, out of Switzerland. And I happen to have my laptop there, and I looked up, and their, their headquarters is, they're right, their holdings are out of Switzerland, but their, their headquarters is in Moscow, and it, it, it is, the CEO is a former KGB operative. Um, <laughs> and so I, I left that one alone, but I'm thinking, but that's what they're, they're trying to downplay that. Now I'm going to let Brian give you his opinion. So um, if you're the federal government, then yes. If you're even UVA, then yes. Um, but if you're a personal user and you're saying uh, Kaspersky's going to attack me personally, that's not going to happen, right? Um, that, it's a different level. Again, it's the gradient of security. So if there it's between Kaspersky and another freemium one, Kaspersky's good. Uh, the problem is, is we don't know exactly what's all going on with Kaspersky. So, and they're really pushing enterprise-type solutions, which are the ones that are, you know, there are black boxes, and we don't know what's going behind them. But the personal firewall, if you're using that, um, I would have no problem with you using that than using nothing. But if you're choosing between, again, it's just it's where you want to set that bar. So if somebody goes, oh, I'm going to uninstall this and just use nothing, it's like, no, that, that probably doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. So I say any antivirus is better than no antivirus. If you have a large number of either similar or weak passports, passwords, is there an efficient way of changing them? Uh, it would seem to be a very laborious process to do it individually. Do these safe programs do that automatically for you? They can. Um, the, the hard part there would be you have to get them all into LastPass. Let's say we're going to talk about LastPass for a minute again. Not that I'm trying to do a commercial for LastPass. Absolutely not. Um, one of the features of LastPass is once the passwords are in there, you can highlight those and say, change my password. And for most sites, it can go out, log in using that password, change it, and then store the new password. Uh, the, the difficult thing is if you've never used it, you're going to actually have to go through every one of those sites and start storing those passwords to get there. But then it could be an automated process. Are the password managers uh, safe from attack? And are you going to give us the name of some to use? So uh, yes and no. Um, there's nothing that's going to ever be 100%. There's no such thing as 100% security. So LastPass has been broken into three different times. Anytime you have any kind of password manager, they're going to be targets by the bad guys. Those are crown jewels. Those are everybody's passwords. The very first time LastPass got broken into, really bad disclosure. They had the bad guys got usernames, passwords, all sorts of things. The second time, they got... Uh, they, LastPass had changed the way they did things as far as having master keys and backdoors. I think the bad guys the next time got basically email address. The third time I think they even got less. So LastPass has, I think the model that they're standing on now is really good. 
um, for a name, LastPass is one. Um, yeah, one password. Um, I think those are really the two. There's, those are say the two top ones that most folks are using. Dashlight. Okay. Okay. Dashlight. Any password manager is better than no password manager, right? Like, 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 let's just go back there. If you wanted to increase your security, saying, um, so I was, I was at a meeting with the undersecretary of the DOD once, and he said, you know, the only secure computer is a computer that's off with a 19-year-old Marine standing beside it. And that is absolutely true. So if that's, do, do you just throw up your hands and go, oh, wow, what are we going to do? You go, no, let's just do the basics. Let's just do what I call hygiene. And if you do hygiene, it's going to secure you from 95% of these attacks. And in fact, the WannaCry, if you just did basic things with WannaCry, back up your data, have a, a password manager, you know, update your files, you're fine. You are fine from those types of attacks. I have a question. I had a really weird experience recently. We've had a credit freeze on our credit reports for years, and I just recently persuaded a relative that he should have one too. And within two weeks, both he and I got a written letter in the U.S. mail from Experion asking, telling us that we had just done something that neither of us had done and asking us to call them. So I did stop. I did think. I looked up Experion's telephone number online, and it's the same phone number as is in this mail. I stopped, thought about that, and I put it in a pile to think about more. But what, what, is, is that, what should I do? Again, you won, right? Um, just by stopping and, and it, it, the, the, thick, the thing is that acting is going out and verifying that information. I think that's what you call them on your terms using a phone number that you found, not on their terms using a phone number provided by them. I think it's completely appropriate. Um, again, you've used mindfulness, so in my mind, you've already, you've already won. Yes, you haven't really discussed much about biometrics. So, we, so biometrics is one of the, so we talked about multi-factor, and we said something on your phone. There's actually three tip, types of factors. There's the things you know. Those are passwords, pens, those things. There's things you have. Your phone, uh, uh, maybe an ID card, something along those lines, and then the third, which is biometrics. That's your eye print, your, your retina scans, your thumbprint, voice. I am not a big fan of that. Um, you'll find this in movies. You'll find it in some federal facilities. It's expensive. If I have to now outfit every computer with a thumbprint reader, it's expensive. The other problem is you only have one of these. Well, I actually have two. If, if someone was able to compromise the fingerprint, let's say they got a copy of my fingerprint, they can now log in as me. Right? We see this in movies all the time. You make the, the, the thumbprint. and you. I can't reissue these. I can get rid of my fingerprints exactly one time, and then I have a nope fingerprint. So it's very hard to reissue. Where a password, we can reset a password. With a phone, you can replace a phone. So I'm not a big fan of biometrics in that. If you have a iPhone, and I think some of the Androids do it now, where it can do the, the fingerprint to log in, great. It's convenient. And typically, the person who gets your fingerprint isn't also stealing your phone. So kind of putting it in perspective that way. Um, but as far as like major systems, I'm not a big fan. Uh, what biometrics does is actually takes your fingerprint, spits it in an algorithm, and creates a password. So it creates a really good password, but that's, it's just creating another password. As Jason says, you can't reset that password. Okay. Basically, did, did you want to follow up, Warren? I, I mean, I got a question, but go ahead. For the password managers, do you have to put those on each device, or is that one one time? And the second one was, for convenience, I stay logged into Facebook and email. Am I adding risk by doing that? Or so the, the quick answer for the first one is so something like LastPass. It's actually a browser plugin, and so yes, you'd want to you would want to put it in all the places you have browsers. Uh, if you have multiple computers, and then you can use the same account to log into it, and so all your passwords are there. Um, the second question was on, um, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, staying logged in. Yeah, 
Right. I think I've been logged into my email since about 1996. Um, no, I really do stay logged into email all the time, and I only if I have to reboot my computer does it um, log me out and I log back in. And I haven't had any trouble. However, I make sure that my laptop is always locked. My phone is always locked. Now, I don't stay logged into Facebook. I don't know. I just feel because that's something that's more public-facing, and I just get a little worried about that. I don't stay logged into Facebook, and that's probably just a, a me thing. Um, but as long as I'm keeping my systems locked down, I've been okay. I don't know if you guys have some different practices. It's the same thing. It, is, it, is it additional risk? Sure, it's, it's risk. It's not a lot of risk. Um, but I, I keep my stuff locked in. But again, it's, it's locking down those computers. Is When I'm not near it, it I go, turn it to the, the password-protected screensaver. So no one's just going to walk up to it and use it. I know you've got lots of questions. Um, they'll be around for about five minutes. We've got another program right after this, so we'll have to um, have them kind of usher out maybe into the hallway. But um, help me thank the panelists uh, for this great talk this morning. On behalf